thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much for being here as well. Um, Madam Chairs, Vice Chairs, members of the Joint Committee on Mental Health, Substance Use and Recovery, thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony regarding an act to combat addiction, accessing treatment, reducing prescriptions, and enhancing prevention. The legislation filed by this administration will allow the Commonwealth to build upon our collective efforts to address the opioid epidemic by continuing to expand pathways to treatment and recovery services, holding the medical community accountable, and strengthening our education and prevention tools. It's not my first time here talking with you all about what we need to do in order to bend the trend in the right direction when it comes to the opioid epidemic. I want to thank you for your cooperation especially your cooperation on the landmark opioid legislation that I think we can all agree on that we signed and worked together on last session. But I don't think, but I think we can all agree that there's much more work to be done, and I believe this legislation will significantly assist the Commonwealth in our continued fight against this disease. When I asked Secretary Sutters to chair the opioid working group three years ago, I challenged her and her team to disrupt the status quo and to act with urgency. To develop best practices for combating the crisis, we learned from families who'd lost loved ones and people struggling with substance misuse and ways in which we could improve access to treatment and stop addiction before it starts. And we listened and engaged in numerous discussions with the healthcare community, advocates, schools, school leaders, individuals with addictions in various stages of treatment and recovery, loved ones, and we also reviewed evidence-based data, all of which have helped to inform and develop this administration's comprehensive package of reforms to improve substance misuse prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery strategies. The first major step was the bipartisan enactment of Chapter 52 of the Acts of 2018 an act relative to substance use, treatment, education, and prevention, the so-called STEP Act, which established Massachusetts as the first state in the nation to implement a seven-day limit on first-time opioid prescriptions for adults. Today, opioid prescriptions are down by almost 30 percent in the Commonwealth. We completely revamped the prescription monitoring program and improved education for young people, educators, and medical professionals about the risks associated with opioid misuse. We also partner with the state's colleges and universities, and today nearly every single future prescriber educated in Massachusetts receives mandatory training in opioid therapy and pain management. We brought together our nine schools of social work to adopt core curriculum and addictions for our largest cadre of behavioral health clinicians. More than 56,000 people across the Commonwealth are now trained to use the life-saving overdose reversal drug, naloxone. Nearly two years later, since the law's enactment and our collective efforts, we're seeing some positive signs of progress amidst the storm. Some of our efforts are he here are even being used as national blueprint to help other states. And for the first time, opioid-related deaths in the Commonwealth have declined after 15 years of double-digit increases by 10 percent. The bill before you, the CARE Act, builds upon that foundational work and offers a more targeted approach to expanding our educational efforts, preventing opioid misuse, and addressing barriers to treatment and gaps in care. In the long run, our ability to meaningfully reduce the problem of opioid addiction will depend on better and wider education about substance misuse and attempt to stop addiction before it starts. The Step Back introduced requirements that every school district in the Commonwealth develop effective substance use prevention education and adopt an individualized assessment tool to screen students for substance use disorders. As a result of our screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment program, the so-called SBIRT program, we've already trained nearly 4,000 school staff in 283 school districts, resulting in 22,000 students screened. The CARE Act builds on that progress by creating a trust fund to help finance the expansion of educational and intervention programs in schools. It will also support the implementation of new school-based models for coordinated support of students in need. My 2019 budget will propose additional funding for school-based prevention and intervention so local schools have the resources they need to combat this epidemic. And we're also adding 
for both public and private colleges in the Commonwealth, programming for prevention and education as part of the enrollment and induction program and orientation programs for new students. The medical community plays a critical role in both fighting and preventing opioid addiction. Massachusetts has seen progress thanks to the use of certain tools like MassPAT, our prescription monitoring program. There is now more accountability for prescribers and these powerful drugs are tracked more closely than ever before. And to date, 95% of Massachusetts providers who prescribe are now registered on MassPAT. There are still vast challenges in front of us. Every year in the United States, over 220 million opioid prescriptions are written for a country with 350 million people. Four to five people who become addicted to heroin start on prescription pain meds. And the CARE Act focuses on six changes that continue to improve the Commonwealth's ability to prevent opioid misuse. First, our legislation mandates that all prescriptions be electronically prescribed by 2020. This will help cut down on fraud and improve tracking and data collection. States including New York and national pharmacy companies such as CVS are adopting e-prescribing as a best practice. Next, to ensure compliance with the state's seven-day prescription law, we believe that it is important that there is a referral process to report providers who are violating the law. Opioid prescriptions issued to treat a work-related injury or a short-term acute pain are putting too many people at risk of developing an addiction. To address this, the bill authorizes the Department of Industrial Accidents, which administers the Commonwealth's Workers' Compensation Insurance Program, to develop an approved drug formulary <clears throat> to regulate the use of opioids in treating workplace injuries. It also creates a commission that will develop recommendations on appropriate prescribing practices for the most common oral and advanced dental procedures. Our legislation will advance the use of blister packs, standardized prepackaged doses, in order to reduce the likelihood of overprescribing. On that one, I'll just tell you that I've had lots of conversations with lots of doctors and especially dentists about why people for so long wrote 30 and 60 day prescriptions for stuff that really would have, three or four pills probably would have been enough. And the answer was there's no mechanism in place to actually issue that type of a, uh, of a prescription. And to figure out how to do this, we would need to create, you would have to give us the statutory authority to engage the medical community and the, and the pharmaceutical community and how to create this type of a model. But I really think if we could create some sort of a blister pack where somebody could literally prescribe the two or three pills or four or five pills that might be all that's required after somebody has a very minor dental procedure or something like that, you could probably dramatically reduce the number of pills that are floating out there in circulation. In addition to that, more and more we're learning that patients don't need those large prescriptions and numerous refills to manage short-term acute pain. And following a change in federal law, the bill improves on the partial fill provision of the STEP Act so that patients will be able to receive a portion of their full opioid prescription without invalidating the remainder of it. More patients may choose the partial fill option if they know they can come back to the same pharmacy within 30 days to fill the rest of the prescription if needed. And as one of the most important prevention tools, this bill increases access to naloxone by authorizing a statewide standing order that will make it easier for every pharmacy in the Commonwealth to dispense naloxone. The bill also encourages broader use of naloxone by guaranteeing that prescribers, excuse me, practitioners who prescribe and pharmacists who dispense naloxone in good faith will be protected from criminal or civil liability. The CARE Act also has a number of provisions to improve access to treatment. First, it creates a commission that will recommend standards to credential recovery coaches, powerful tools to keep individuals in long-term recovery. The Commonwealth currently has a few recovery coach pilot programs, and last week, Secretary Sutters and I visited one of those programs up at Beverly Hospital. During that visit, we spoke with a patient who credited his recovery from opioid addiction to the help of his recovery coach. The recovery coach, who was also in recovery, first sat with the patient for several hours in the emergency room after being brought in from another overdose. The patient told us that without the recovery coach's intervention, he would have left the hospital and gone right back to using heroin. Instead, for some reason, and I hear this a lot, for some reason, the conversation between 
the recovery coach and the person in the emergency room clicked and they chose to develop a relationship that was built on the active support of that recovery coach to provide guidance and support to that individual so that he went into treatment and has stayed into treatment and is now helping to run a sober home uh, primarily because of that moment in the ER. We think recovery coaches can be a tremendous asset in our fight against this disease. But it's important that families and other people, family members who have family members who are dealing with addiction and other people who are dealing with addiction have some capacity to understand what a recovery coach actually can do. Um, there are a lot of people out there these days and they are all enormously well-meaning who call themselves recovery coaches and some have taken some pretty sophisticated training programs, but some are just working off what they know. And in a world in which so much of the opportunity for recovery, especially for people who are dealing with opioid addiction, requires a sustained effort over a fairly long period of time for somebody to stay clean. Having people who actually have the training in and the experience and the sort of counseling support and active engagement that's required to help somebody stay clean over what many people would say is somewhere between six months to a year and a half for most people to truly get clean, we need to have some kind of mechanism in place that can help people develop that credential and then provide families and people who are dealing with addiction access to some guidance with respect to how they go about selecting that particular person. The CARE Act also focuses on two areas where we must improve access to treatment, ensuring that people who are suffering from opioid addiction receive the specialized treatment that they need and expanding access to treatment through the emergency room setting. I'm going to let Secretary Sutter speak to both of these. Thank you, Governor. Madam Chairs, <laughs> Madam Chairs, <laughs> members of the committee. <laughs> um, all of us would agree that voluntary treatment for substance misuse is the best course, but there are times when it may be necessary to involuntarily admit someone. Involuntary treatment is and should be used only as a last resort. However, when used clinically appropriately, it can save lives and provide an opportunity to engage someone to accept treatment. Attention has been drawn to a 2016 Department of Public Health study known as the Chapter 55 report, which found that people who received involuntary treatment were 2.2 times more likely to die of opioid-related overdoses as compared to those with a history of voluntary treatment. However, the same study found that during the 2011 to 2014 reporting period, 98.6% of those individuals who were involuntarily committed survived and were among our sickest and most complex patients as compared to the individuals who sought voluntary treatment. And I'd be happy to go over that if you have questions. Massachusetts law currently allows for involuntary treatment for addiction referred to as Section 35 or sometimes is just sectioned. However, under current law, the courts are the only pathway to involuntary treatment. Courts are only open during normal business hours, Mondays through Fridays. The hospital is not a pathway to involuntary treatment for those at imminent risk of harm as a result of a substance use disorder. If an individual is administered Narcan and transported to an emergency department, which as we know often happens, they may refuse a substance abuse assessment. In fact, 50 to 90 percent of individuals who are offered the substance abuse assessment in emergency rooms decline. They may refuse that substance abuse assessment and walk out of the hospital. Every day, our emergency room physicians make heroic medical decisions with the best information available to them. We know that. The bill proposes two important changes to the current Section 35 process. One permits medical professionals or police officers to authorize the involuntary transport of a patient to a substance use treatment facility for the emergency assessment and treatment when the patient poses an imminent risk of harm to themselves or others. I didn't say hold, I said involuntary transport. 
The treatment facility is then required to attempt to engage the patient in voluntary treatment for a period up to 72 hours. In cases where a patient poses an immediate risk of harm but remains unable to engage in voluntary treatment, medical professionals at the treatment facility would be required to petition a court to commit the patient for involuntary treatment under our existing Section 35 of Chapter 123. In listening to the concerns expressed previously by some in the medical community, the bill provides civil and criminal protections for the individuals making these assessments and determinations. The second change expands the type of medical professionals who can file a Section 35 petition with the court. Too often, we've heard from desperate families who have nowhere else to turn when they're in need of immediate help. Crises of addiction occur 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not only during the hours when court is open. Additionally, by not allowing a clinical pathway to involuntary treatment for addictions, it contributes to the stigma that addiction is a criminal matter and not a disease. This provision is effective in the year 2020 to allow for clinical standards to be developed for these involuntary assessments and for the expansion of additional treatment capacity. As you know, the 2016 STEP Act introduced a requirement that medical staff in an emergency department conduct a substance use evaluation and pri provide information on addiction treatment for any patient treated for an opioid overdose. The CARE Act aims to improve upon the effectiveness of these, of these bleh, I can talk, of these consultations by expanding the range of medical professionals authorized to perform the evaluation and by requiring that the emergency departments affirmatively connect the patient with appropriate levels of care, including connecting patients to a recovery coach or an inpatient substance use treatment facility. The CARE Act also contains other important provisions. In order to ensure that the appropriate types of treatment facilities are available to serve every patient who needs treatment, the legislation strengthens the oversight authority of the Departments of Mental Health and Public Health, the two agencies that license facilities that provide treatment for addiction and our mental illness. Before licensing new treatment programs or approving the transfer of a license of an existing facility, the departments will require that a facility demonstrate that it provides the range and quality of services necessary to meet the current critical treatment needs of the Commonwealth's patients. Prior to receiving a license, providers may be required to demonstrate that they can treat individuals with co-occurring mental health and substance use disorder and make treatment available to patients with public health insurance, and yes, I mean Medicaid. The CARE Act also establishes a commission to recommend standards that specify how licensed behavioral health clinicians represent their specialty and capability to insurance carriers and patients. These standards will use evidence-based treatments to categorize providers, so in the future, individuals seeking treatment for substance use, misuse, for example, can more easily and effectively find providers that meet their specific needs. We'd like to thank the committee and legislature for your continued partnership to address the opioid crisis. Our work to fight this epidemic is never done, and while we have made some progress, we know there's so much work to do. Thank you very much.